Okay, so it's noon. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome to the second lunch lecture in the 2021 AIA Baltimore and Baltimore Architecture Foundation annual spring lecture series. My name is Kelly Dans, and I'm the lecture series committee co-chair. I'm an associate at Ziggerstein Architects and I am an NDC board member. Uh, the lecture series brings visiting and local speakers to address design in the context of a relevant theme. The lunch lectures focus entirely on Baltimore specific topics within this theme and revive a longstanding tradition of BAF forums. The lecture series is celebrating its 43rd anniversary this year and 2021 also marks the 150th anniversary of AIA Baltimore, the Baltimore chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Thank you to our lecture series and our annual sponsors. The lectures wouldn't be possible without the generous support and partner partnership of these sponsors. I'd also like to thank the lecture series committee for all of their hard work. Randy Sovich, co-chair, Eric Shore, Suzanne Frazier, and AIA Baltimore's Margaret Stella and Kathleen Lane. Today's lecture will address public lighting in the Station North neighborhood of Baltimore City. We are excited to welcome and introduce Merrill Hamilton, of the Neighborhood Design Center to present the Signal Station North project. Merrill Hamilton leads Signal Station North, an NAA funded pro project to plan for, invest in, and improve access to high quality lighting in the public realm. As program manager for the Neighborhood Design Center, Merrill supports implementation and design build projects, including a forthcoming designer in residence program that will activate green spaces in East Baltimore neighborhoods. Prior to her work with NDC, Merrill produced public art projects with New York-based nonprofit Creative Time and artist Stephen Powers. She has a dual MA in social design and critical studies from MICA and a BA in history from Columbia University. Before Merrill begins, just a bit of housekeeping. There will be a Q&A discussion at the end of the lecture. Please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. The chat box is for general dialogue and we will not be reading any questions from the chat box. Thank you for joining us. And now I'll hand it over to Meryl to get started. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Can everyone see that all right? I don't know, I can't see many people, so. You can see it. <laughs> okay, great. Wonderful. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Kelly and AIA Baltimore for inviting the Neighborhood Design Center to be here today. And thanks to everybody who's here in attendance. Um, I hope I can entertain you during your lunch break um, and, and raise some interesting questions. Um, before I start, I also want to just thank uh, my team. I wanted to thank my colleagues at the Neighborhood Design Center and the Central Baltimore Partnership and also the Signal team, Flux Studio, Bruce Willen, Pickle, Kayla Ostro, Maura Dwyer, and Ruby Waldo. This project really is the collective work of over a year and a half, and everything I'm gonna to share today was produced in close collaboration. Finally, and especially thanks to the neighbors of Station North for welcoming us in to work with you in your neighborhoods and for generously sharing your experiences, memories, and ideas around life. As Kelly mentioned, today I'm going to be sharing the Signal, Signal Station North, a project centered on planning and advocacy for lighting. Sorry, I'm getting chat notifications. <laughs> um, a project centered on planning and advocacy for lighting in the public realm of the Arts District that began in July of 2019 and will conclude this summer. It's a project led by the Neighborhood Design Center alongside many others. NDC, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you, is an organization that was founded in Baltimore in 1968 and then has been partnering with communities to envision and build great public spaces ever since. Before I jump into the details of the project, I'm just going to set the tone a little bit and get us thinking about life. Uh, to that end, I hope you'll indulge me as I start us off with an excerpt from an Elizabeth Bishop poem called Memory of Baltimore, which I will read to you. <laughs> we passed through about six o'clock and avoided downtown Baltimore, just before dark one spring evening. 
some trick of sunset where all the row houses looked lavender. Only overhead, the lights came on, clear bulbs, huge imitation diamonds in white frills, delicately bright in the long rose light, light after diamond, after diamond, after diamond. I like this poem partially because it's about Baltimore and light, but also because it captures the singular nature of sunset and Baltimore and this fleeting moment between the end of daylight and the start of evening when the street lights come on. The infrastructure of public light in Baltimore can sometimes look like imitation diamonds or like setting suns or give no light at all. And the nighttime environment has many sources of light beyond the public lighting infrastructure, parking lots, parks, storefronts, living rooms. Light is a part of the public realm that we often overlook. It's most evident in its absence, or as I think our lighting designer Glenn Schramm might say, in its overabundance. Light supports our experience in public space in ways obvious, it lights our way, and less obvious. It helps us keep time, it serves as a guidepost. It creates a sense of place. And just as light can welcome us in, it can also keep us out. You may recognize this is a diesel powered tower floodlight on Greenmount Avenue, just north of the northern boundary of the Arts District. These are lights that are often used to mark crime scenes and sometimes they're used to provide supplemental lighting when the existing light infrastructure is insufficient. Light can make us feel alert, focused, wary, or assured, calm, invited. What are your memories of light? What comes to mind when you think about light on your street? What is your experience of light in Baltimore? These were the questions that rooted our thinking as we began work on Signal Station North, a project designed to plan for high equity creative lighting, sorry, high quality creative lighting in the public spaces of Station North, to implement projects that demonstrate the recommendations of that lighting plan, and to create tools for community members to better advocate for high quality lighting in their places. Typically at the Neighborhood Design Center, community groups approach us with an idea for a project in their place, be it a park, vacant lot, streetscape, or schoolyard. Signal is a little bit different. Though we had heard over and over that lighting was an area of concern for community partners, we'd never had a partner bring us a project focused on light. But we knew that a light planning project could meet community needs. In addition to the interest articulated by communities over the years, we knew that each of the neighborhoods of Station North, Charles North, Greenmount West, and Barclay had pursued lighting investment on their own. Also in 2018, the Neighborhood Design Center led a public space planning process for the Station North Arts District. And a block audit from that process identified lighting as one of the top three areas of infrastructure in need of investment. With support from the National Endowment for the Arts, Our Town Program and the Central Baltimore Partnership, BOPA, the mayor's office, and many others, we began planning and research in the fall of 2019. Though we initiated the project with the Charles North Community Association, we've since made connections with the Greenmount West and Greater Greenmount Community Association as well. Because the signal project was initiated by NDC and because the Station North Arts District is such a large and diverse footprint, a robust and creative response res and responsive community listening process was necessary. Our project began in 2019 with listening, and we've continued to listen along the way through community gatherings, surveys, site visits, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and neighborhood workshops. Today, I'm going to share some of these approaches to listening and what we've learned from each. And I'll share first that the goals of listening for us at the outset of the project were that it carries throughout the two-year timeline of the project, that we collect data on how people understand the district at night, that we understand people's values around light, 
that we check our assumptions around what people see and experience in the nighttime environment, that we offer educational, exper experiential education, not just talking and listening, that we understand and share the way that light holds power, and that we support people to people engagement. Before I jump in, I just want to share this project ecology document. Uh, it's both a tool for sharing the project and an internal resource for us. And essentially, it details the two year timeline of the project and illustrates uh, different elements and outputs of the project alongside our community engagement and community listening efforts. And what I appreciate about this document, which was designed by our project uh, associate Ruby Waldo is that it illustrates how our community listening and our community engagement efforts, which are in green and yellow, uh, carry through the course of the project from beginning to end. So listening to uh, our neighbors in Station North is not something we started and finished, it's something that is ongoing. Uh, so I'm gonna begin with Flash. Um, Right. <laughs> the danger of the scroll. Uh, Flash was an event that we hosted at the outset of the Signal project. Uh, it was uh, it took place on November 6th of 2019. And the background for the project is that uh, at the prompting of Glenn Schramm, the wonderful founder of Plug Studio, who has partnered on this work since day one, uh, we wanted to start by putting light directly into people's hands. We wanted to let people witness firsthand, indeed to be a part of, the transform transformative power of light. Drawing on the history of guerrilla lighting interventions, flash mob style events where participants collectively light dark spaces and sites with flashlights, we invited our neighbors to illuminate Station North with us. With a group of 40 volunteers armed only with flashlights and glow sticks, we set out to light four sites across the district. And you can see here a map of the walking route that we took that evening. I'm gonna share images of all four of the sites and uh, you can see the effect of these 40 flashlights in action. Uh, so you may recognize this corner. This is the uh, park at St. Paul in Lafayette. And this is a site that uh, has quite a bit of public art. There's a mural on the uh, ground surface of the park, and there's also a mural um, on both of the facing walls, uh, none of which is visible, as you can see, in the dark. Uh, then when we arrived with our crew, you can tell uh, how radically that changed. And uh, this, uh, again, is, is a group of, of 40 people. And uh, the light is a combination of just regular unfiltered light and color filtered light. Our next stop was the median on North Avenue. Uh, you can see uh, we caught it right before it became a uh, a home for some trees. Uh, so we were able to stand in this median. And this site we selected because we wanted to illustrate how light uh, interventions, possibly a, a light-based art could transform the, the streetscape. So we asked our group of 40 to move into the median and begin to shine their light. And you can see how um, even this small action immediately changes the feel of, of this site. Our third stop was the Seventh Baptist Church on St. Paul and North Avenue. A beautiful building. Um, I'm sure many of you who are architects uh, can appreciate uh, what, what is unique about this space and what, what is, uh, deserves to be honored here. Um, and you can see that at night, again, um, the majority of the church is, is really completely in the dark in spite of the relatively bright street lighting um, on this uh, south facing wall. 
And once we lit it up, you can see how dramatically it highlights all of the architecture of the building, including uh, the very top fire there, which we were excited to be able to hit with one of our high powered flashlights. This was a site that people were in the neighborhood particularly were really excited about and excited to see this church um, honored with beautiful light. Our final site was the North Avenue Market, um, a little bit brighter than some of the others, but you can see these really interesting cupolas at the top are pretty dark um, and that, you know, generally uh, there's not a lot of uh, action happening here in terms of lighting. So we brought some color as well as light to this site. You can see we actually managed to get a few uh, brave volunteers to scramble up the ladders uh, into the cupolas to light them up. So uh, one piece of the event was not only demonstrating the impact of light, but also creating a moment for our volunteers and sort of creating a, a sense of community uh, grounded in light. Um, since we had to advance on mass through the district in order to light the selected site, we thought it would we thought we would turn it into a bit of a parade. Drawing on New Orleans style second line tradition, we hired the incredible local brass band Sac Olay to march and play alongside us as we moved from site to site. I'm gonna try to play a video here. Whoops, seems like this might not work. Okay, we'll skip the video. If anybody was there, uh, I'm sure you can testify to how lovely it was to have a uh, trombone accompanying us through the, the chilly November evening. Um, the music was really appreciated by everyone, I think, and made it feel like an event. Um, we even had one mother and son who heard the music as they drove down North Avenue and they actually stopped their car, got out and joined uh, the parade and stayed for the rest of the evening. Our final stop was the Why Not Lot, a public event space in Station North. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, um, where we wel welcomed volunteers and spectators to join us for hot cider, tamales, and more music. We also set up a screen where we projected the before and after images of all four sites for the attendees to see. In addition to demonstrating the impact of light, we wanted to get people thinking about how light works in the arts district. Working with then at Micah student and Franz Merrick fellow Ruby Waldo, who's still working on the project. We created a community listening activity centered around light. This was our first chance to hear directly from people who live, work, worship, and play in Station North and get their thoughts and feelings around light. And I'll just share some of those insights. Um, when these sort of ranged from the emotional, remembering uh, a sunset in Accra and uh, the norm of turning your porch light on to supplement city light to the more practical. We need pedestrian lighting, we need street lighting, and I'm used to some very dark spots. The content of these uh, half sheets and the events of Signal were eventually uh, used by Ruby uh, to build uh, one of the first outputs of the project. This is a guide to noticing light in the neighborhood, um, a free zine that we produced, which uh, shares the project and also offers some ways to think about light that are a bit unexpected and a bit different from how people typically think about it, if they think about it at all. We printed 400 copies of this scene and it has been a, a element of the project ever since. It's something that we hand out in public and at community gatherings. Um, and it's been a really wonderful way to bring the continuity of that first piece of the project through to where we are now a year and a half or more in. Uh, so, shifting away from flash, um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, analysis and how community listening informed this process. Following the flash event, we moved into the data collection period of the project. This was centered on two main activities, an analysis of current lighting conditions in the district and a mapping exercise to help us understand people's experience of the nighttime environment. Flux Studio conducted the lighting analysis and NDC led the mapping interviews, but critically, both efforts were informed by the other. I'll start by sharing the lighting analysis um, and uh, I would recommend uh, eventually hearing this firsthand from, from Glenn and Laura who did, did all of this wonderful work, but I will try to do it justice. Uh, so in back in 2020, Flux Studio took stock of current lighting and facade lighting conditions in the district, identifying trends, problem areas, and opportunities. Throughout the survey, Flux focused in particular on the pedestrian experience. And I'm going to quickly talk through the existing light fixtures in the district, light color, light and shadow, glare, and facade lighting. First, uh, just looking at the light fixtures, the um, prominent typologies that exist in the district. On the left, the pedestrian post top acorn. Uh, you can see many, many of these in front of the uh, Board of Education building. The roadway pole light, which is an LED light. Um, and finally, uh, the roadway pole light, which is uh, the older halogen light, uh, which you'll see images of gives off a, a very different color than the LED light. One of the key observations that Flux made uh, around light color was that uh, there's a lot of inconsistency in the nighttime environment in the Station North Arts District. On this map, you can see the blue area. This is where uh, the older HPS lights have been upgraded primarily uh, or almost large, almost entirely to LEDs. Uh, and over in the Charles North commercial district over here and residential area, you can see that there's still a lot of the older HPS lights. And then when you see this striping here, um, that indicates a mixture of LED and HPS lights. And the effect of that is just, again, an inconsistent, um, not cohesive uh, effect of the nighttime environment. They also looked at light and shadow. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, something that Glenn revealed to me, um, which I found quite surprising actually, was that much of the district is actually overlit. Um, many of the streets, sidewalks, and building surfaces uh, have bright light that contrasts really sharply with dark shadows. And you can see in some of these images how that sharp contrast uh, actually lowers visibility. Um, you can see in this image of North Calvert Street at Trenton Street, Street how this bright street light uh, casts the alley into dark shadow. Glare, another effect of extreme brightness or overlighting. You can see here how many of the lights in the district emit uh, really bright, harsh light that can be uh, difficult to see things in the surrounding area. And finally, they looked at facade lighting. Uh, you can see on the left here at Guilford Apartments that there are working fixtures on the North Avenue side of the building, but that the fixtures uh, that run down Guilford have actually been turned off because there's so much light spill from lights in the surrounding area that there's just no need for additional lighting here. Um, you can see the Walbert, this is a building that does have some facade lighting, but that it's a bit inconsistent and uh, doesn't necessarily highlight the building um, in, a, in a beautiful way. And then finally, looking at a, a Another example, uh, the Parkway Theater. You can see how this facade is actually a bit darker, uh, but that it's lit uh, rather than intense facade lighting by the light spill from inside the building, which um, 
adds a feeling of sort of activity and liveliness to the sidewalk and the surrounding area. So we wanted to understand how these current conditions that Flux identified uh, map onto the ways that people actually use the district at night. Uh, so working with Flux, uh, myself, Maura, and Ruby, and with the support of the NDC staff, we worked to develop a mapping tool that was designed to document users' experiences of the district after dark. Uh, you can see here an early iteration of the map where we were separating out night and day and asking people to mark their destinations uh, on either one. People found this to be a little confusing, so we evolved yet again into a combination of daytime and nighttime experiences mapped on a single map. Um, this was also a bit challenging for people. Um, and we landed on a, a final iteration that was sort of a combination of the, the previous two. Um, but the goal of these maps was that we asked participants about their nighttime destinations, the routes that they take to and from those destinations and their relative comfort levels on those routes and at those destinations. Later, we decided to add a question about desired routes, routes that people would like to take, but choose not to because of feelings of discomfort. This exercise was originally intended to be conducted in person in a facilitated group setting. We'd actually scheduled a series of meetings for this purpose, and we were able to host one with Safe Haven uh, Center on Charles Street before mid-March when COVID made it necessary to end all in-person engagement. So our plan to have uh, hundreds of mapping exercises in a uh, big group events with snacks and um, social time did not happen. Um, so at that moment we paused, we asked ourselves whether it would be effective or ethical to continue the engagement process. And after about a week's consideration, we pivoted to a one-on-one -on -one telephone, telephone interview model. And you can see the scripts that we developed for this telephone interview here. Um, in this version of the conversation, we, uh, the NDC team interviewed folks about their uh, experiences in the nighttime environment, and then we actually mapped up, uh, marked up the maps ourselves. And what we found that was, we found that not only was this a decent compromise, but in fact, it yielded much richer conversations, insights, and values. Uh, I'll say that when we did do the one workshop in person, um, in addition to folks feeling a little confused about how to mark their routes on the map, um, we found that there were lots of side conversations happening about why people didn't go to certain places or why they didn't take certain routes, and that that was actually what we wanted to capture. Um, and we were missing all of it because we were running around trying to um, help people figure out whether to use a dotted line or a straight line. So um, this uh, COVID induced sort of shift actually was a, a benefit to the project in the sense that it pushed us to this telephone style one-on-one um, -on -one interview. One challenge that we encountered with the telephone interview, however, was that um, whereas with an in-person meeting, we were able to set up time with uh, individual interest groups or institutions or host series of public meetings that anybody could come in for. Um, with the phone model, we just had to reach out to people whose numbers we had. Um, so we started out with the list of people who had signed up who were interested in the Signal project. Um, and we also asked the community association to, to or, sorry, we, we included people who had signed up during meetings at community association. And we started using a phone tree system where we asked people to uh, share other people they thought might want to do the interview. But we found at a certain point that we were getting uh, sort of ricocheted back to uh, the same group of people that we had been in touch with initially. Uh, and we needed to push outside of that. So we took a couple of approaches. Uh, we printed a paper card, which we distributed uh, throughout um, Charles North Barclay and Greenmount West uh, on a selection of different blocks. And we also opted to offer compensation. Um, 
we did this as an acknowledgement of people's time and expertise. Um, we offered a tiered system uh, and we also offered the option to waive it. Um, so you could either take nothing, take $10 or take $20 for the interview. And, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, we also had an alternative for anyone who didn't have internet access in the form of gift cards. And we found that this definitely helped us get outside of that uh, more sort of uh, design world uh, group that we had first been in contact with uh, through our list of flash attendees and uh, community association members. And you can see here the demographics of, of who we ended up speaking to. We had 77 conversations, which ranged from about 20 minutes to an hour. And uh, we talked to a decent range of people, although we felt even after our efforts to kind of broaden our reach that we still weren't quite reaching as diverse an audience as we wanted. And uh, we made it a goal to come back around um, with uh, uh, additional uh, engagement efforts following uh, the mapping exercise. Um, I'll just share quickly some of what we heard. Um, one thing that was really interesting about these conversations is that they centered much more on people's emotional, um, psychological, and social relationships to light. Um, and we really wanted to capture that and uh, we wanted to, to keep that thread going through the project. So what we did was we went through all of the transcripts of the interviews and we pulled out threads or themes. Um, and we distilled those direct quotes um, that were along a certain thread into community identified values. So uh, lighting that emphasizes the artistic character and assets of the neighborhood was one that we took from. I think of the soft red iconic sign of Club Charles. It's soothing and says, come inside. The light that emanates from the man woman statue at the train station comes to mind. I'm not a fan of the statue, but it's with its light, it's almost like a guidepost. So we identified 14 values through that process. Um, and I'll just read them through for you now. Um, lighting that emphasizes the artistic character of the neighborhood, lighting that supports comfortable movement through the nighttime environment on foot, by bike, and by public transportation, lighting that supports wandering freely through the district at night, lighting that emphasizes the existing character of the neighborhood but doesn't seek to redefine it, Lighting that supports the presence of a mix of different people in public spaces. Lighting that supports connection between neighborhoods, that emphasizes the architectural landmarks of the neighborhood, that suggests the presence of residential activity, that suggests the presence of commercial activity. Lighting that feels warm, homey, and inviting. Lighting that supports access to neighborhood spaces at night and lighting that shows care for place, but doesn't feel antagonistic or like surveillance. Uh, so in addition to those key values that we identified and that became a, a, a key thread for the project and conversations around light, uh, we also created a series of maps. And I'll just share a couple with you here. Uh, one was centered on comfort and discomfort. Um, you can see the orange uh, areas are where there are higher feelings of discomfort and the green areas are where there's a higher level of comfort and those are centered around the um, commercial and residential areas of Charles North, around Penn Station, around Open Works, and around City Arts. Um, and just to say that uh, no one area was described as entirely uncomfortable or entirely comfortable. So all of these represent a mix of different responses. We also created a map that overlaid all of the different data points that we collected during the mapping effort. So uh, comfort and discomfort, nighttime walking and biking paths, desired paths, and nighttime destinations. And we use these maps overlaid with the 
um, analysis of current conditions uh, to help us understand where we wanted to focus recommendations for the lighting plan and uh, the interventions that we'll be working on over the summer. Um, I'll wrap up um, with uh, that next layer of engagement that I mentioned. Um, as I said, we really felt like with our first round of engagement, we just hadn't quite reached a representative mix of people in the district. And we also wanted to check our assumptions and the information that we'd gathered thus far. Uh, so to do that, we um, printed out our 14 values, laminated them, bought lots of hand sanitizer and uh, various sprays and, and brought them out into the world. Um, we ended up hosting seven tabling sessions that were between two and four hours each in different areas of the district. And we talked to, um, I wanna say uh, another 60 or so people through this process. Um, so we had lots of conversations and essentially we asked people to react to the values that we had identified during the previous effort um, and tell us what they thought. So we set up our uh, little table with our beautiful post typography designed uh, tablecloth that made us highly visible. And uh, you can see us here having conversations on the left in the why not lot and on the right um, with residents in Greenmount West. And you'll see the, the zine that we produced um, with content from the flash event was there as well, um, just kind of maintaining continuity between these different periods of engagement. And we asked, as I said, residents to share with us which values resonated the most with them. What we heard was that, uh, I'm sorry, we talked to um, many more than 60 people. We talked to, I think, almost, uh, I guess, even more than 91, I think. Um, we heard that uh, the top three values that people uh, felt resonated with them were lighting that supports movement through the nighttime environment on foot, lighting that supports access to neighborhood spaces at night, and lighting that supports comfortable movement through the nighttime environment via public transportation. We also asked people to tell us which sites in the district they were most eager to see additional lighting investments. And uh, we heard from folks that Greenmount Avenue between 20th and Oliver, the Trout Street Corridor, Greenmount and North Bus Stop, North Calvert Street between North and Penn Station, and in a tie for fourth, the Baltimore Design School, Guilford Avenue between North and Oliver, and the Why Not Lot were people's top priorities for additional lighting uh, investments. So where are we now with the project? Um, I'll share a few updates and then I'll turn it over to Q&A. Um, we are currently in the process of finalizing the lighting plan. We're also working on finalizing sites and design for a handful of recommendations from the plan that we'll be installing in the next few months. We're sharing our work and of course, we're still listening. Uh, this is an image of uh, a project uh, test that we did a couple of weeks ago. This is me and Glenn from Flux. Uh, this is a photo that Bruce Willen took. Um, this is a project that came out of uh, the engagement and analysis called Light Gallery, where we will be installing a series of three high powered projectors. Uh, throughout the district, which will um, project uh, curated art onto uh, blank walls and also um, use light to create community spaces. So going back to that value, uh, light that opens access to neighborhood spaces. Uh, 
This is an image uh, again with our, our table and tablecloth from a site visit that we did at the Wonderground in Greenmount West. Uh, you can see the design team from Pickle here, as well as some residents. Uh, the Pickle team is working with residents of Greenmount West to come up with a creative lighting intervention for the Wonderground. Um, we just had uh, our first co-design session for that last week where we actually had residents um, joining a shared board and drawing on site plans and it was really exciting. And then finally we're working on some advocacy tools and uh, workshops and this is a draft of an illustration that we're working on um, which will help uh, people in the district understand how best to report an out, outed streetlight, and also how to navigate uh, advocating for more uh, lighting investment or uh, infrastructure in their place. So uh, we conducted interviews with uh, the lighting folks at DOT and also BGE, and these in-depth interviews led to uh, a deeper understanding of what these processes look like that we're hoping we can make more transparent and more accessible to people in Station North and throughout the city. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, I think I'm a little over 40 minutes. So thank you all for, for listening to me for so long. And I hope I can answer any questions that you have. Great, thank you so much, Meryl. Um, this is a really great presentation and such a cool project. Um, so we're gonna do a little Q&A in 20 minutes or 15 minutes we have left. Um, and I have a question to start off with. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the interventions or the solutions that you're gonna be implementing? Sure. Uh, so there are three types of <clears throat> projects that we will be um, implementing from the recommendation. Um, one that I showed you is the light galleries intervention. Um, this is a project that Bruce Willen initially conceived of that, um, as I mentioned, uses high powered uh, projectors to uh, cast, you can see in my final image here, you can do a range of things with these projectors from images to text. Um, and we're working on installing those in three sites, um, one in each of the <clears throat> neighborhoods that comprise Station North. We're still working on finalizing what those sites are. Uh, so I, I can't say with uh, um, certainty where they'll be, but um, we're in conversation with all of the respective communities about where they'll go. And uh, hopefully we'll have updates on our website soon. Um, another project is called Modular Light Fixtures. This is um, a really beautiful um, sort of pixelated light installation that I don't have a handy picture of, but uh, will essentially be applying a sort of scattering of rainbow lights across uh, the back wall and side wall of the Save-A-Lot building on Maryland and 20th. Um, this was an area that we heard over and over um, felt dark and uncomfortable to residents, particularly a lot of the senior residents living at the J. Van Story building, which is right uh, at that corner. And then finally, uh, the third project is the one that Pickle's working on now. So um, that effort was uh, sort of needed to be a little bit more custom, customized to the underground space. And so we don't yet know what form it will take, um, but we've had lots of interesting conversations about illuminated greenhouses and uh, lit up corridors and all sorts of things. Yeah, that's really exciting. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> Okay, so we have um, a couple questions in the Q&A box. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna read, uh, read this out. So someone says, I'm a member of St. Mark's Lutheran Church, or sorry, St. Mark's Lutheran on the corner of 20th and St. Paul. Um, he was wondering if anyone from the congregation could be uh, included in the future in terms of um, community engagement. Absolutely. I will take your name down, Brad. If you want to share your email to me in the chat, I will take note of it and be sure to be in touch. Thanks for being here. 
Okay, and the next question is, um, did we see this right that the older yellow HPS lighting is seen as more comfortable than the new whiter LED lighting? That's an interesting question. Um, I have heard a range of responses on that. Um, I think some people prefer the softer, more yellow orange quality of light and other people feel that it's um, makes them feel unsafe, like it's not offering enough light. So um, people's perceptions of light color um, definitely vary. Uh, I will say that I didn't share a slide uh, that deals with uh, color rendering. And uh, one thing to note about the HPS lights is that they um, tend to flatten the color of the environment. So uh, it can be hard to see variation in color um, when, they're, when the HPS lights are the only thing illuminating a space. Um, but on the other side, as you saw, the really bright LEDs can make it hard to see for other reasons too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so next question. Um, We know that light pollution is a problem and that's getting some attention in, in cities as well. Do you have thoughts on how to balance um, welcoming lighting and light pollution? Mm, that's a great question. Um, and that has come out come up throughout the project. Um, we've had lots of conversations where people are concerned about adding additional lighting and the effect that it might have on bird migration and um, the ability to see the stars at night, um, things like that. Um, I can't offer any specific sort of best practices or recommendations off the top of my head, um, but I, I will say that um, I know Glenn uh, has thought a lot about this, uh, the lighting designer we're working with, and it's something that we're definitely taking into account with this project. Um, we're actually hoping to um, be in touch with uh, uh, a guy in the neighborhood who's working on bird migration issues and uh, we definitely want to include that at least um, in the final plan to offer some best practices around lighting and, and wildlife and, and you know the nightscape. That's great yeah I think that's the question that uh, came in. Will there be coordination of the efforts with Lights Out Baltimore which works to protect my, migrating birds from the effects of urban lighting? Yes. Oh, definitely. Cool. Um, okay. Someone is curious about the cost of the lighting projectors. Um, sure. Um, I would want to double check my budget, but I believe they are twenty five hundred dollars. Um, and I should say that. Uh, the part of the plan for the light galleries is that we are working to assemble a steering committee um, with representatives, representatives from all three neighborhoods uh, to create a framework for what the curation of those projectors looks like. And we hope that it will be a combination of um, curated work from you know outside the city or outside the country and also um, a platform for uh, local artists to, to share their work as well. Cool. Yeah, so the next question is, are you planning to do any changing our production so that people could use Station North as a street gallery walk? Um, yes, that is very much what we want to do. Um, we're still sort of working out what the rhythm of that looks like and how we kind of manage the logistics around it. But we're really excited about having this um, platform that that sort of echoes the culture, the beautiful mural culture that already exists in Station North, but that can be a little bit more responsive and nimble, um, you know, that can evolve um, as times change and, and can feature the work of many more people. So uh, I'm looking forward to sharing kind of what that process will look like once we have it finalized. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um... Uh, I'm just going to skip down. Is there a way to get students involved in work in this project or work like this during the summer? Um, wow, that's a great question. Um, 
so gosh, I didn't get to tout all of the many uh, events and happenings that will be going on related to Signal in the coming months. And I definitely encourage everyone to visit our website um, and our Instagram, Signal Station North and SignalStationNorth.com, um, where we'll be posting upcoming events. But we're definitely going to have uh, some more youth-oriented workshops. Um, we also, uh, this summer, separate from the Signal Project, uh, NDC is going to be leading a designer in residence program, and we are planning to do some community build days uh, through that, which we'd love to welcome students to. So um, anyone uh, who's interested is welcome to reach out to me uh, directly about that. I'll put my email in the chat. Great. Okay, so another question. The, the blank walls of the Parkway edition at the corner, corner, corner of Charles and North were specifically designed for video projection. Is there any of that planned? Wow, um, I actually didn't know that that is what they were designed for, but we, when we were doing our site tests with the projector, we did actually uh, shine it up on the Parkway and I was marveling at how uh, perfect a platform that seemed to be. Um, so we haven't um, we haven't talked with the Parkway about that. Um, the something to note about the projector that we're dealing with is that it's only for static images. It doesn't accommodate video. Um, we would have loved to have that capability, but a durable, high quality projector that can project video costs um, twenty thousand dollars. So <laughs> we couldn't quite afford it. But I hope that the Parkway does that because it would be really wonderful. Yeah, that's cool. Um, okay. Are there any efforts being made to get buildings to turn lights out um, and windows to prevent bird deaths? We say that one one more time, Kelly. Right. <laughs> Are there any efforts being made to get buildings to turn out their lights and windows uh, to prevent mm -hmm. uh, bird deaths? Wow. Um, I have to say, I don't know anything about that. Um, I know birds crashing into glass during the daytime is a problem, but I didn't realize that, that it was an issue at night, but I will read up on it. And hopefully if we can uh, make contact with uh, folks who are working on the, the bird issues around lighting, I can understand it better and, and we'll try to include it. Okay, cool. Um... I just have one more question. Um, so the next steps for the project, I guess, you know, we're still in this pandemic world, but were there, are there any future community engagement um, session or work sessions scheduled or do you plan to schedule them in the future? So we are definitely gonna be scheduling sh uh, sessions to share the project out as we sort of near completion with different elements. Um, I'm hoping that those can be in person again, but um, if not, we will work around it as we have um, over the last year and a half. Um, I will say that we are gonna be hosting um, a series of uh, community walks uh, starting toward the end of April and into May. We haven't scheduled the dates yet, but I will share them on the website and our social media. And we're going to be um, leading two different kinds of walks. One that's going to be centered more around the sort of science of light and observation of, of light in the, the arts district. And the other that will be a little bit more around sort of sharing, sharing and storytelling uh, around light and sort of memories of light and, and experiences of light in the, in the district. So those should be really fun. Um, we're hoping we can do at least six. Um, one of both types of walks in each of the three neighborhoods. Uh, so, so please check back and join us for those. They should be great. Um, and we're also going to be uh, Ruby Waldo, who created some of the, many of the beautiful graphics, um, and the zine that I shared is going to be um, building that illustration I shared at the end into a second iteration of the zine, and we're going to be sharing that out for free in the neighborhood as well. We have, uh, I managed to track down with the help of uh, a family friend, uh, three newspaper boxes. So we're gonna put one in each of the three districts and um, cool. hand those out. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, 
there's lots more. There's so many things um, that we're hoping to do around the project. So please, as I said many times, just, just keep checking in. That's awesome. Um, and what about the, I guess it's the report or the um, you know, recommendation? The report. When will that be available? Yeah, so we are very close to completion on the plan. Um, it, it exists in draft form. Um, so I would say that will probably be publicly available um, by May at the latest. Um, and we are planning to circulate it broadly. Um, it will be digital, um, but, but printable. So uh, hopefully folks can share it in different ways. Great. Um, unless anyone else has any more questions, um, we have about five minutes left. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, Meryl, thank you so much for sharing this project. Um, I think it's a really exciting project. I'm, you know, really looking forward to seeing um, your recommendation, like the recommendations from the report, and you know, the solutions. Um, it's just a yeah, really thank you. Question. Yeah. So thanks um, so much for having me. Uh, yeah, I, um, I can't see any of your faces, but I I believe that you're out there. <laughs> um, so once again, thank you to our 2021 Spring Lecture Series sponsors and our annual sponsors. Um, our next evening evening lecture is on April 21st, and we will explore architecture and social justice with. Dayton Schroeder of Smith, of Smith Group and Maisie Hughes of the Urban Studio presenting. Uh, and thank you all so much for joining the AIA Baltimore and Baltimore Architecture Foundation today for the, the spring lecture series. Uh, we, continue, we appreciate your support as we continue in this virtual world due to the pandemic. And we hope that we can see you in person for an event soon. Um, and thank you again, Meryl, for your time and your presentation. It was great. Thanks so much. Thank you.